1987, Henry Crevis faces a difficult decision. Jerry Kohlberg has been Henry's most important mentor. He welcomed the young graduate Henry to his team at Bear Stearns. He mentored Henry and facilitated his fast ascent through the ranks at Bear Stearns. And he introduced Henry to bootstrap investments which would later be known as LBOs. But now, Jerry Kohlberg is standing between Henry and the biggest LBO deal in history, RJR Nabisco. A deal so spectacular, it would later be portrayed in movies and cinemas. That deal would be against all business and ethical values that Kohlberg stands for. Long-term mentor or mega deal? Henry has already made his decision. If there were a king of private equity, it would need to be Henry Crevis. Henry is an absolute pioneer. He's an innovator. He's an icon. Like Morgan, like the Rockefellers. For young ambitious people, the private equity industry is one of the most prestigious industries to work at. And Crevis single-handedly shaped this industry like no other. If you've got a hope and a belief and a dream, uh, follow it. No matter what. And he did follow his dreams, sometimes with the ruthless efficiency that is required to get to the top. He's a fighter and a competitive fighter. Henry's biography offers numerous lessons, even more so as even today, at a high age, he is pursuing ambitious projects in the business world. Henry was at the forefront of the 80s. You look at Henry today, it's the same story. Henry's right at the top. Crevis is born into a Jewish family in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Tulsa is known as the oil capital of the world for most of the 20th century. Profits from the oil industry continued through the Great Depression, helping the city's economy fare better than most in the United States during the 1930s. Not only does this lead to a massive construction boom in Tulsa in the popular Art Deco style, it also makes Henry's dad, Raymond Crevis, massively rich. His father is a successful Tulsa oil engineer and entrepreneur, and is even a business partner of Joseph P. Kennedy. All black gold everything. Henry's father is making his family a fortune. This has a significant effect on Henry. Sure, he grows up in a comfortable situation and does not need to worry about money. But there is something else, a burning desire deep inside that's causing Henry to want to outwork anyone, and especially one particular person. As a man who had a very successful father, uh, wanted to show that he was every bit as successful as his father was. Henry attends private liberal arts college Claremont McKenna College, also known as CMC. During that time, CMC is still a boys only college, which might be the reason that Henry is able to focus on the important things in life, money and power, because growing up in the 60s helped shape the grand vision for his life. It was a decade of tumultuous social, political, economic and cultural change. I understood that these rapid and disruptive changes could help me look at who I was and who I should become. His initial professional experience leads him to New York. After school, I would drive my car from California, from uh, Claremont uh, Men's College at the time, to, uh, to New York, and I worked on Wall Street. There, he is picking stocks at a time when the level of degeneracy on Wall Street was existent, but not digitized yet, through groundbreaking innovations such as options trading by virgins on Robinhood or shit posting on Wall Street bets. There's two types of people in this world doers and academics. Henry is a doer and doesn't enjoy spending time at the university. Fuck school! Fuck all this bullshit! What the fuck? Nevertheless, after his time in New York, his father convinces him to go back to university to at least have an Ivy League stamp on his CV. Columbia Business School. You've got to understand, there were very few times that I followed my father's advice, but this time I'm thrilled that I did follow my father's advice and I stayed at Columbia and 
It did teach me a great deal about uh, value investing and finance. Armed with an MBA from CBS in 1969, Henry is finally done with all the boring academic distractions. And he will soon prove that he's a genius doer, fresh out of business school. His first full-time job is at Bear Stearns in New York City. Investment banking seems to be part of the crevice DNA. Henry's cousin, George Roberts, also graduates in 1969. And he also also joins Bear Stearns around the same time as Henry. They are both assigned to the team of corporate finance manager Jerome Kohlberg. Jerome Kohlberg has been working at Bear Stearns since 1955, so already for around 15 years when Henry and George join. A senior leader with credentials such as Harvard MBA and a Columbia LLB, Kohlberg becomes the manager of the corporate finance department. As such, Jerome is the perfect mentor for young Henry and George. At this time it isn't obvious, but Bear Stearns will become the breeding ground for one of the most consequential trios in the history of finance business. In the 1970s, what is to become the private equity industry is in its early stages. Today, outside of financial circles, many people don't realize the influence of the private equity industry. But ambitious Kevin John followers, commonly referred to as baby silverbacks, as well as other non-betas know the private equity industry wields massive influence on the world around us. That's why every year, hundreds of thousands of young ambitious people dream about joining a private equity firm in the future. When I was in business school, there was nothing sexier in this entire world than private equity. It's exactly where you went if you wanted to one day own an island. And one of my classmates just bought an island. As so often, there is one big reason why the triumvirate of Henry, George and Jerome are able to initiate this massive industry timing. See, PE is not complicated. I think the best way to think about private equity is to think of somebody buying a home, trying to fix it up, and then selling it. This is not rocket science, yet something important changes when Henry starts his ascent to the Olympus of business titans. Essentially, investors have been acquiring businesses and making minority investments in privately held companies since the dawn of the Industrial Revolution. Merchant bankers in London and Paris financed industrial concerns in the 1850s. During the Industrial Revolution, 19th century, some investors bought and restructured mainly railway, telegraph and steel companies. Throughout history, private equity was really more venture capital. So money was primarily invested in young companies and startups until something revolutionary happened. President Dwight D. Eisenhower signed the Small Business Act of 1958. That provided government loans to private venture capital firms, allowing them to leverage their own holdings to make bigger loans. Then, in the 1960s, shortly before Henry, George and Jerome would shake things up, something resembling a private equity fund slowly emerged. And there were no funds in those days. Maybe a couple venture funds, that was it. These venture funds organized so-called limited partnerships to hold investments in which the investment professionals served as general partners, GPs. And the investors, who were passive limited partners, LPs, put up the capital. The compensation structures still in use today also emerged, accidentally, as Henry explains. So let's approach eight people and see if they'll give us $50,000 each and agree to do that for five years. And then we gave them the option that if uh, we found a company, we'd come to them first and they could invest. And uh, But if they did, we wanted 20% of the profits. That's how this 20% started. There, we just picked it out of the air. It could have been 25% or 15%. Henry and George would go on to amass billions of assets under management and become billionaires through this new 220 compensation structure. But first, they needed Kohlberg to teach them how it's done. In the late 1960s and early 1970s, Kohlberg alongside Bear Stearns executives began advising a series of investments that would later be known as LBOs. That was not what it was called in those days. What it was called 
uh, was bootstrap acquisitions. Their acquisition of Orkin Exterminating Company in 1964 is considered to have been among the first significant leveraged buyout transactions. Travis and his brethren create a series of limited partnerships, as mentioned earlier, to acquire these various corporations. In most cases, they put up 10% of the acquisition price from their own funds and borrow the rest from investors by issuing high yield bonds. And we bought uh, oh, probably uh, seven or eight or nine different companies in the early 70s, culminating in the uh, largest acquisition that Bear Stearns uh, did, uh, which was in 1975, was a company called Encom International. And it was the, the industrial components group of companies uh, from Rockwell. And we paid $92 million to buy this company. And uh, uh, Bear Stearns, I remember, got the biggest uh, fee they'd ever gotten, uh, which was in 1975, was uh, $950,000. Crevis is generating millions for the firm. And Bear Stearns has a culture that rewards high performers like Crevis. We came from a firm which was an eat what you kill firm. He becomes a partner at 31, something that is close to impossible under normal circumstances. And Crevis is starting to dream bigger and bigger. This is where the megalomaniacs separate themselves from the average ambitious. They are never satisfied. And this leads to a massive conflict. Travis and his two colleagues make the plan to take their careers to the next level. In 1976, they prepare multiple proposals to raise a dedicated buyout fund under the Bear Stearns roof. This would give them even more leverage to pursue great deals while maintaining the security that comes along with working for a massive institution like Bear Stearns. They approach Bear Stearns managing partner Cy Lewis. So we went to see him and said we would like to focus on private equity and we'd like to give Bear Stearns a half interest in this new vehicle we'll set up within Bear Stearns, and we'll keep a half interest. And as luck would have it, immediately he said, no, we have no, no interest. You're either here or you're out. While Bear Stearns MD Sai ends up dying two years later on the evening of his retirement, when he unwraps his retirement gift, a golden Piaget watch, the trio has already made their decision. They are going to try to raise their own fund. The name would consist of their initials and would go on to shape the history of finance in a way few other institutions did. KKR. 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 In 1976, the three men leave to form their own firm, Kohlberg, Kravis and Roberts, and their starting capital, quite limited. We started with $120,000. I put up $10,000, George put up ten. that's all we had. We didn't have any more than that. Jerry had a little money and he put up 100,000. Little money, so they have big pressure to make their first deal work. In April 1977, using mostly borrowed money, they decide to buy a maker of small truck suspensions, AJ Industries. Purchasing price, 25.6 million. Eight years later, they will sell the company for 75 million US dollars. In 1978, KKR goes to the market to get more money to manage. They offer their first 30 million LBO fund to institutional investors seeking alternative off-market investments. The offering paper suggests returns in the 30% to 40% area. Selling the funds is Henry Kravis's job. He develops a number of loyal supporters, especially in the Northwest, where the state pension funds of Washington and Oregon are early investors. Henry succeeds with a 30 million LBO fund under their belt. Henry, George and Jerry are ready to rock Wall Street. What they don't know at this point is that the three of them will not work together for a long time and money will always win over friendships. But first, it is deal time. The trio shocks the world of finance with bigger and bigger deals, taking on more and more risk. The fourth LBO fund from KKR is sold for $1 billion in 1984. LBOs can be executed with equity, making up just around 10% of the cost of the acquisition. This indicates that at this point, KKR has a mass 
purchasing power in the market of more than 14 billion US dollars. KKR is now officially the silverback gorilla in the LBO sector and their acquisition of sugar refiner Amstar in 1984 is a brilliant example of how to make mind-boggling amounts of money using LBOs. If you like numbers, you will love the next minute. In the Amstar deal, only 52 million US dollar of the 465 million acquisition price is equity and only 830,000 US dollar or 1.6% of the equity is contributed by Henry and his two friends personally. The rest comes from their funds. A Merrill Lynch LBO partnership purchases Amstar three years later. Total transaction profit, 232 million US dollar. This represents a compound rate of return of nearly 80%. KKR receives its 20% carry, 46 million US dollar, plus a capital gain of 1.6% of the profit, another 3.7 million US dollar. But that's not all. KKR charges investment banking costs of around 1% of the purchase price and another 1% of the sale price. And lastly, the 52 million US dollar in equity invested in the Amstar equity is managed by KKR funds for a 1.5% management fee. On a three-year investment of less than 1 million, these fees together give KKR a cumulative return of almost 62 million US dollar. And this deal is only 1 50th the size of the RJR Nabisco Colossus four years later. If you want to dig deeper on the dynamics of LBO deals and how PE firms somehow always end up on top, I suggest to read Asvad Demodorant's The Anatomy of an LBO, Leverage, Control and Value. I have already posted the PDF in our Discord community for ambitious people looking to build a career as steep as Henry Crevices. Another one of the reasons LBOs work so well is because we humans love money so much. As a CEO earning a million a year, would you ruthlessly sacrifice some employees jobs to earn yourself tens or hundreds of millions? Any reasonable bait man would. And it's very easy. Take out your notepad. Here's how it works. LBOs often entailed a premium over the last sale price of the target company. This premium had to be generous to win over the management of the target companies. The truth is, many ambitious CEOs would have loved to sell their businesses to KKR for a large sum of money and then join KKR as the CEO of a new leveraged management team that would share 20 or 30 percent of the new shares of the company. The reorganized business would operate on a cash only basis for six to seven years while paying off its debt. When the firm went public again, it would have low debt, high earnings, and a streamlined, effective and highly driven management team. The stock that the management had purchased for little to nothing could then be valued in the millions or perhaps hundreds of millions of dollars. In 1986, Henry and George reinvent the LBO business once again and take on more risk than ever. KKR buys a company called Beatrice Foods for 6.7 billion US dollar. But there's a big difference this time. The company's management doesn't agree with the deal. And Henry wants to partially finance the deal through the public sale of 2.5 billion in junk bonds. This is the first time that junk bonds and LBOs are connected. And Jerry Kohlberg doesn't like that. It is against some of his fundamental principles. Kohlberg prefers cordial agreements to win the support of management. Henry is not afraid of doing hostile company takeovers. Kohlberg dislikes paying high sums for the businesses he's buying. Henry is willing to pay whatever it takes, also in the case of Beatrice Foods. Kohlberg opposes taking on too much debt. Henry is okay being over levered to the tits, as are many Robin Hood traders. In the end, Henry gets what he wants but with massive consequences. For one, the company ends up being in such high debt that the deal return for KKR ends up being below average. But there is a bigger problem. The relationship between Kohlberg and the two cousins Henry and George is seriously damaged. The unthinkable is about to happen.
every kitten grows up to be a cat. They seem so harmless at first, small, quiet, lapping up their saucer of milk. But once their claws get long enough, they draw blood, sometimes from the hand that feeds them. For those of us climbing to the top of the food chain, there can be no mercy. There is but one rule. Hunt or be hunted. In 1987, Kohlberg departs. Today, there's a firm called Kohlberg and Company. It has around 60 employees with a total transaction value of 30 billion US dollar. Although the average transaction value per employee is not bad. One thing is very obvious. This firm is much smaller and much less known than KKR. It's like comparing the NBA to the WNBA. Same sport, yes, but different levels. Kohlberg and Company was obviously founded by Jerry Kohlberg. Henry and George have learned a lot from Jerry, but they have outgrown him at this point. What was once an important mentor is now just a mere colleague with opposing views on KKR's strategy. In 1987, Kohlberg departs and starts his own firm, supposedly with quite a bit of drama. What Henry doesn't know is that the biggest drama of his career is just about to begin. I never thought that there was such a big deal when we uh, when we made the offer. I guess it wasn't until I woke up after we bought it and uh, that was really a big deal. The famous RJR Nabisco deal is the biggest deal at that time. It is also the preeminent example of corporate and executive greed, inspiring a book and movie called Barbarians at the Gate. Most of Jerry Kohlberg's fundamental deal principles were broken by the deal, particularly the one about paying too much. But his opinion doesn't matter anymore. RJR Nabisco Inc. is an American conglomerate selling tobacco and food products. Its president and CEO, Ross Johnson, triggers the fiercest contest of the leveraged buyout era in 1988 by attempting a management-led purchase of the maker of Ritz crackers, Oreo cookies and Winston cigarettes. So the next day the stock went, as you would imagine, from $52 a share to $77 a share. Together with Shearson Lehman Hutton Inc., Ross makes an initial bid to take the company private at $75 per share. Henry is not happy about the fact that Ross is trying his hand in the LBO business. The idea that a deal of this size would be done without consulting him, it's like if some governor from Georgia went over and tried to inject himself into the Middle East peace process, how would George W. Bush feel? I mean, no one else can do deals like this. These are my deals. The company board needs to approve the offer by CEO Ross, but they are not impressed. This gives Henry Kravis room to woo the company's board and shareholders with a richer offer. But KKR is not the only bidder. A fierce series of negotiations and proposals ensues, which involves nearly all of the major private equity players of the day, including Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, Salomon Brothers, First Boston, Wasserstein, Perella, Forstman Little, Shearson Lehman Hutton and Merrill Lynch. Once put in play by Shearson Lehman Hutton and Ross Johnson, almost every major Wall Street firm involved in M&A launches frenzied literal last minute bits in a fog of incomplete or misleading information. Murphy's Law something's going to go wrong and so things always they never work out exactly as you uh, plan them so you've got to make room for the possibility that things will not be exactly as uh, as you had hoped or as you planned so we built that into that capital structure in the end there are just two bidders left to acquire the company and take it private ross johnson backed by shearson and henry representing kkr ross's final offer is 112 us dollar per share henry's final offer is 109 us dollar per share a bit lower will ross johnson steal the deal away from henry the difference between the offers is small and the company board wants to pick a buyer that will add value to the company. As part of their financial package, both parties have proposed some variable rate notes. To decide for one of the two bidders, RJR Nabisco's bankers ask each side if it would agree to reset the interest rates at the end of a year if the bonds are not 
trading at par, essentially increasing the interest rate in the future if market conditions or other factors change. Ross Johnson cites declines to do so. And KKR agrees. No debt, no risk, no price is too high. This helps. And they spent from 8 o'clock in the morning or so when we appeared before the board until 7 o'clock that night debating, you know, did they want to take the Ross Johnson Shearson offer or did they want to take the KKR offer? <clears throat> and I felt enormous relief uh, when they came out and said, all right, you've won. KKR wins, but now the real pressure is on. It had to work because it is under a microscope and everybody in America is waiting for this thing to fail. The deal attracts massive publicity. Whether he wants or not, suddenly Henry Kravis is the protagonist in most finance shows and newspapers. But it turns out he just won a tiny battle. He is about to lose the war. Any fool can buy a company, you just pay enough. That's the easy part to make an investment. That's the easy part. The hard part is what do you do with the business? How do you create value? What do you do to make that company much more efficient? Travis taps Louis Gerstner, president of American Express, to become chief executive after the deal is concluded. Mr. Johnson departs with a payout that some estimate at more than $50 million. He is later featured on a 1988 Time magazine cover headlined A Game of Greed. A year later, the reset provisions for bonds come into effect and a cash-stressed RJR Nabisco has to meet them. To do so, most of the bonds are bought out from cash supplied directly from the KKR funds. This significantly dilutes their equity and reduces their leverage. The deal never gets any better from there. There are brilliant financial restructuring and debt reduction efforts from the company management, but gains are offset by continuing losses in the increasingly intense tobacco wars. And that's why I always say not to congratulate us when we, when we buy the company. It's congratulate us when we've done something with the business to create much more value. And in 1991, another tragedy strikes Henry while trying to take RJR out of its tailspin. Harrison, his 19-year-old son from a previous marriage, gets killed in a car crash. His life hasn't been simple. His personal life has had a strong sense of tragedy. Losing his son, you can try and imagine, but you can't really go there. Two years later, when Crevis divorces Carolyn Rome, his wife of seven years, the tabloids are full of news. He remarries Mary Jo Drew, a well-known philanthropist and economist. By 1995, tobacco litigation and cigarette price wars have decimated RJR's revenues, resulting in a pitiful annual rate of return of less than 1%. Holding onto RJR is no longer worthwhile, according to KKR. They sell their holding, and one of the most most famous battles on Wall Street. The acquisition of RJR Nabisco is completed. You ask whether the RJR deal is Wall Street's finest hour. I don't think anybody would call it its finest hour. I think if anything, someone argued that it was its worst hour, its lowest hour, its most demeaning hour, an hour when all the things, all the stereotypes that Main Street in America believes about Wall Street, that that it's doing things for ego and greed seems so demonstrably true to the rest of the country. In the 90s and early 2000s, Henry's track record stays bumpy. We started making a lot of mistakes, late 90s. We bought uh, some technology companies, not, te uh, not internet companies. We also bought a company in the movie theater business called Regal Cinemas. Uh, we put up $500 million and our partner in it, uh, Hicks Muse, put up $500 million and we lost our money. Travis and Roberts know that they need to regroup. It gets silent around KKR. George and I sat down and, and said, we really have to change the way we do business. We have to get away from just transaction-oriented and financial engineering to operational improvements, operational excellence. The shift from financial engineering to operational excellence echoes through the entire private equity industry. And after several years of refining their business strategy, Henry and George are once again making headlines in 2006. They buy the hospital chain HCA, valued at a massive price tag of 33 billion US dollar. KKR beat all the records with the HCA deal in 2006. 
then KKR beat that record with the TXU deal in 2007. So they came back and they came back fierce. While HCA, a deal KKR conducts together with Bain Capital and Merrill Lynch becomes a very successful deal, generating billions for the firms involved. TXU, the next record breaker, is a disaster for Henry and KKR. Things are gonna be okay. When private equity giants KKR, TPG Group and Goldman Sachs Capital Partners come together in 2007 to make a $44 billion bid for TXU Corp, they don't foresee the calamity the deal would eventually become. In just seven years, what amounts to be the largest buyout in history in the relatively stable electric utility market will become the largest non-financial bankruptcy in US history. At the time, the bet seems logical and the buyout, while expensive, seems relatively safe. But something terrible happens. The price of natural gas falls. Coal plants owned by Energy Future Holdings begin to lose money. And the more than 40 billion in debt used to take the company private become a weight dragging the business down. By April 2014, the company cannot make its scheduled debt payments and is forced into bankruptcy. Even Warren Buffett, who provided 2 billion in debt finance for the deal calls it a big mistake and even though the deal is an absolute disaster KKR TPG and Goldman Sachs Capital Partners still managed to pull 560 million US dollar in advisory and monitoring fees out of the company since the buyout where is the alpha there you know where where is the gain the and alpha's in the fees Okay, there you go. While this was simultaneously a disaster and a small win for KKR, Kravis' most exciting deal came from somewhere you'd never expect. See, in 2008, as the rest of the world grappled with a financial collapse, Kravis was at Sotheby's auction house selling an Edgar Degas painting from his collection for $37 million. A $9 million profit from his original purchase just 10 years earlier. This isn't just a one-off. Crevice has one of the biggest art collections on Wall Street and it's not just for looks. Notice that 9 million dollar sale was in 2008, the same year as the financial crisis. Even with the market imploding, art as an asset doesn't behave the same way. In fact, it's got some of the lowest correlation out there to other asset classes. Even lower than firms like KKR, which means when stocks take a dive, art may not. We can see this in action even in 2022, as stock markets had the worst start in 50 years, with $13 trillion wiped out. Art sales hit their highest ever first half total, $7.4 billion. But if you want to use art as a portfolio diversifier like Crevice does, we run into a problem. The millions of dollars needed to start collecting, and that's where masterwork saw an opportunity to make history. Masterworks buys multi-million dollar art from legends like Picasso and Banksy and breaks it into shares for their investors. So you can get art into your portfolio for a fraction of the full cost. Best of all, when Masterworks sells a painting you've invested in, you get your share of the potential profits. So far, Masterworks has sold six paintings for an average net return of 29% to their investors and their collection of unsold art has appreciated by 50 15.3% according to internal valuations. With results like that, you can see why they have over 500,000 members and over $500 million under management. You can also see why Masterworks has a waitlist to get started, but you can skip it just by clicking the link in the description. With wins and losses under his belt, Henry has forever cemented his legendary business titan status. A true primus inter pares in the world of private equity that has assembled an army of the brightest kids on Wall Street working for him. One thing I want this firm to always have is the main maintenance of our culture and the maintenance of our values to always hire the best people, to give the best people an opportunity that they wouldn't have elsewhere, to trust them, to work with them, and to work as a team. At this point, it is worth noting a couple of learnings from Henry Kravis. Henry, with his aggressive facial structure, teaches us it is not enough to look ruthless. You need to be ruthless too. The road to power is paved with hypocrisy and casualties. 
In the right moments in his life, Henry Crevice was able to do what was necessary, not what was pleasant. Separating from Coleman, taking on more leverage and risk in his deals, or cutting employees. In an interview, he admits a mistake he has made again and again. We might have been too slow in changing out some CEOs of companies we had. Keep thinking that he or she will get a lot better. I can pretty well tell you, what you see up front is pretty much what you'll see in the end. You can help around the edges, but people don't change that much. I think today we move much faster than we ever did. Ruthless efficiency. That's how you get to the top. An important lesson for any aspiring business silverback watching this video. But that's not all. Crevice and Robert say their biggest challenge is to resist bureaucracy and KKR on one hand and to fight the arrogance of some younger colleagues on the other. One senior KKR executive used to insist on having a baby grand piano in every hotel room he stayed in, regardless of cost. What the hell? That sort of practice is no longer tolerated. I have a sign in my office, arrogance kills. And arrogance keeps old people in power for too long, even though they should hand the reign to successors. Henry does not want to make that same mistake. In July 2017, Crevice and Roberts announced that they will eventually be succeeded by Joseph Bay and Scott Nuttall, who were named co-presidents and co-chief operating officers so that they might gradually take over daily operations. This succession plan is enacted in October 2021, with Crevice and Robert stepping down from their positions as co-CEOs but continuing as co-executive chairman. This will ensure KKR stays on course. And I cannot tell you, particularly young people coming out of college, how long it takes to build a really good reputation in business but how easy it is and how quick it is that you can lose it. But like any good billionaire, Henry Kravis is diversifying his activities and net worth. In addition to being active on numerous non-profit boards and philanthropic organizations, he's building up his own startup portfolio. It already includes stakes in no fewer than 25 tech-heavy startups in areas from crypto to prediction markets to food and delivery apps. He has even hired a venture capital full-time to help scout for startups and manage his growing portfolio. As of March 2022, KKR has 480 billion in assets under management. Their portfolio companies generate 265 billion in revenues and employ a global workforce of 819,000 people. If you scroll through the KKR portfolio, you realize what a massive monster Henry Kravis was able to co-create. And by the psychopathy of Bateman, some of us in the Kevin John community shall reach similar heights in our lifetime too. I can't emphasize that enough, and it may not be what you want to hear. I know you want to hear, geez, what's the magic formula so I can go start the next KKR? There is no magic formula. It's just be well-educated, be broad, don't be so narrow. Uh, because you're not going to be uh, the most additive if you're too narrow.